you have to check. So you conjugate that matrix, either the one that rotates the side or the one that's gonna, that uh, uh, does the element of order 3. And when you conjugate to get 0 infinity to match the ai, bi, ai plus 1, bi plus 1, then you end up with those matrices. So there, there's your formula, just like in the free case to check. So I hope you guys got to see the, the visual presentation of gamma 0, 13, where there were two elements of order two and two elements of order three. So you might want to, I hope you got some practice with it last night and stuff too, if you in your bag. Um, but here's the explicit formula for the matrix. You can see things that look like I and rho if you stare at the formula. Okay, so that's the, I hope that makes sense. If there are any further questions we can uh, discuss today during one of the exercise sessions, if you're still not sure about how the algorithm works. Um, today we're gonna talk about modular symbols. I introduced them yesterday. It is a giant q-vector space of symbols. The basis is given by uh, elements of p1q, that's uh, rational numbers union infinity, modulo this uh, relation that says that if I do the path from alpha beta, beta gamma, and then gamma alpha, I've created a trivial path. Um, we just declare this to be true. If you are a topologist, you would say that this is the homology of the upper half plane relative to the cusps. And we proved using the Euclidean algorithm in the guise of continued fractions, finite continued fractions for rational numbers, that this Q vector space is spanned by the single symbol infinity zero if I hit it with SL2Z and then I take all the Q linear combinations. So you might think about this as a Q square brackets SL2Z module, and then it is generated by a single element over that new value. Okay, so we're going to play with the modular symbols for a congruent subgroup. Okay, 
So I'm going to introduce another term, which I'm allowed to do by the by paths. So I took this alpha beta and I split it up by going not from directly from alpha to beta, but via layover at gamma alpha. Okay? Now um, you can reverse the order of this. And then recombine this guy, using again the relation in the modular symbols. And what do you get? Well, I guess you don't have to take the layover in gamma alpha. Okay, so that is to say, because this is equal to zero in M2 gamma, uh, you could have equivalently taken relations not of the form something minus gamma something equals zero, but you can also take relations that look like this. You sort of take an element here and an element here, and if they differ um, in, the, in the same way by a common element of gamma, then they're also equal to zero in the quotient. Okay, I'm doing that because there are different definitions of modular symbols, but this board shows you that they are the same. Okay, one interesting thing then is that you have a map that says gamma to the path alpha comma gamma alpha for any alpha in the group. And all, it doesn't matter what your choice of alpha would be. You'll get a common image in there. Let me, let me write that down somewhere. Maybe this is just a remark for those who like to think topologically remark. Gamma, all right, so it eats an element gamma and it maps it to the path alpha gamma alpha for any alpha. Uh, okay, and we should be interpreting this maybe as uh, an element in the H1 of the quotient. So the X of gamma. Do you see what I'm saying? The whole point of the right-hand board is that it doesn't matter which alpha I pick here. Because if I pick beta, instead, they're equal as paths. And similarly, in the modular symbols, the that identification. So you're already getting to see the relationship between this uh, the modular symbol space and, more, and deeper homology of the. This is the kind of thing that you want to do, want to have if you want to integrate, which is also what we're going to be doing very soon. OK, so that's a good start. but. How, how do we actually link these two? How, well, to get a path in X gamma, we need to start and end at the same place. Okay, so these are just paths relative to the cusps. And if we actually want to deal with things in homology in the quotient, I need to add an extra condition, which is that don't just take any alphabet. You have to start and end in, in the same place, right? That's how you get a loop. So here comes the co-boundary stuff, right? So uh, you let uh, B2 Hope your sponsor advanced. Do you have a math cal backslash math cal script B here? So this is the Q vector space with basis uh, P1Q. This has a natural action of GL2Q. This is going to keep track of the beginning and ending points. Okay, so we're going to define a map which takes a symbol and then take a kernel, right? Just like you do. So that we'll, similarly, we'll want a B2 gamma. So this is B2 mod gamma. So you can think about this very concretely as the Q vector space uh, with basis the cusps. Right, so if I looked at the image of all of the elements in P1Q, those are the, those are the cusps 
of course, many of those cusps are identified. And when are they going to be identified? Exactly when they're identified under gamma. So in the fairy symbol discussion yesterday, and is in the magma discussion, we got to see representatives of those cusps. And that's what this set is, right? And then this is just the whole set of possible elements. And then you write down a boundary map, which takes symbol for gamma. OK, and I guess you could also do this for the M2 and the B2. But the, I, only, I only care about the, the M2 gamma. And uh, what, what should we do? Well, we want to keep track of when we start at the same place. So that means you take your alpha, beta, and you map it to beta minus alpha. Strictly speaking, you have to take classes everywhere, but I'm going to continue to denote a symbol and it's represent as a representative up to the equivalence of the relation. Okay? So um, this delta, this boundary map is well defined. Right, you have to check something. It's clear it's well defined on the M2 and the B2. Well, I guess you have to see that. Um, all right, let's just do the calculation, not decide whether how much of it we needed to do. Certainly we need to check that something like this go, goes to zero, right? That's the, for the M2, that's what you need to check, right? So you have a, send your symbol to something, and then I take a quotient vector space. So if I'm going to have a well-defined map of Q vector spaces, anything that was quotiented out by needs to tend to zero under the image. And that's intuitively clear, right? I mean, I'm taking path, path, path. I'm supposed to end up back where I started. This is a formal calculus. OK, but then you, uh, probably while I've been talking, you already proved it, right? Beta minus alpha plus gamma minus beta plus alpha minus gamma is equal to 0. OK, and then for the M2 gamma, you have to check that, well, with these symbols. So you do alpha, beta minus the gamma alpha, gamma beta, that this thing goes to zero, right, for the gamma and gamma. And this thing is a beta minus alpha minus uh, gamma beta minus gamma alpha. And this is also equal to zero in the M2 gamma. Okay, sorry, the B2. This is zero already in the M2, so you could, sorry. I'll get it right, in the V2 without the gamma. I didn't have to use the relations there. So this, the second step is there. OK, so um, let's define S. Oh, wow, my scripty S is not good. S, how about that? S2 is the kernel of the boundary, and then uh, on the M2, Right. Do you see it? All right. S2 gamma. So this is the kernel of this thing. So on M2, just say that. And then this thing on M2. I just have two maps there. I don't want to keep track of them. But yeah. Sorry, I think I got lost. Why do we need? So is this the boundary, or is this okay? So can you explain why we can find the map? That's okay. What, what I said was we were going to actually want to have loops in the quotient, which means we've got to keep track of a loop is a path where you have the same starting at any point, right? So this is the map that keeps track of starting at any point. So an element in the kernel can be thought of as a linear combination of loops, right, as opposed to just paths. That's, that's what that gadget keeps track of. So these things are called cuspidal modular symbols. Sorry to be writing so low. Why are they called cuspidal modular symbols for, for gamma if you're talking about the, the, the second guy? Well, uh, because they'll, we reuse the word so many times. There, there are things related to cusp forms um, implicit down here as opposed to Eisenstein series, more general modular forms. That's the reason why cusp. But if you're thinking topologically, it's because you're getting moves. They're linear combinations of paths whose endpoints are in the, in the boundary but whose images in the X of gamma are linear combinations of loops. Okay, that's the interpretation of this S2. Is that okay? Can we just say that again? So these are linear combinations 
of paths in the upper half plane with endpoints at the boundary, whose images in X of gamma correspond to linear combinations of loops. Same endpoint, okay? So, now we can talk about the relationship to homology. You shouldn't be surprised by this if I've done a reasonable job of setting it up, that this S2 should be the homo represent the homology of the quotient X of gamma, right? I just told you linear combinations of loops. So, and that's a theorem, which is commonly attributed to Manin, who's one of the forefathers of modular symbols. And it's, the, the map is called the take the path map. Does that make sense? So, the symbol is just a symbol. Okay, but then we can take the path, and we can take the linear combination of the paths, and that will give us an honest element of homology. This is not a zeta. I heard some people laughing about how bad their zetas were. There was a criticism. <laughs> so this is an isomorphism. So, in other words, you take, uh, all right, it's called take the path map. Alpha, beta goes to the path between alpha, beta. You have a linear combination of those guys, you take the corresponding Q linear combination. Usually you take integers here, so you actually think about integer paths, but then sometimes there's torsion and you're not interested in torsion today. Okay? So that's why I'm putting Qs everywhere, otherwise we just have C modules and Maybe you want to take FP vector spaces or whatever, okay? But this is, uh, or eventually, I don't know, we're going to tensor with R and C because we're going to want to talk about modular forms themselves, okay? Uh, so this M2 gamma is really a relative homology group via a relative chain complex, and that's the way to prove this thing. Okay, so if you, it's almost by definition, after you have the right general infrastructure among your army of knowledge, uh, this, this pops right out, okay? So I don't... It's so believable, I'm not, I'm not going to, I won't say anything, okay? Now, what do you do with paths in mathematics when you're presented with them? Well, you integrate, is what you do. And, as you know, these integrals on curves, well, they depend on the homology class, right? So if I'm going to take a, if I have an integrate over a loop, which I can contract, just like in complex analysis, I'm going to get zero. But if I do a loop around a non-trivial hole of the Riemann surface, then I get a non-zero complex number. I have to keep track of those. How do I keep track of them? Well, it's by this guy. Well, strictly speaking, the Z, the Z homology. Okay? So now let's integrate. What is integration going to do? Well, it relates this back to functions, right? So integration will give me a pairing that will relate the homology to functions, and those functions are going to be my modular forms. Okay? So I need things to integrate, you guys, and the things that you integrate are differentials. They better be holomorphic. Uh, I'm going to get poles when I integrate, and I want to get complex numbers. I want to take residues or something. That's also very interesting, but today I want them to be holomorphic. Okay, so is that a big scary thing or a super happy thing for you guys to talk about differentials? I mean, I just put my app, said, put that on the board. Okay, how do you... Yeah, of course. So, why would we need to model the boundary? So, I would just think of the kernel as a homology. Why would there be no, like, image of... You were evaluating homology, you think kernel of image, right? That's right. So, yeah, why would we need to model the boundary? Didn't I do that with the B here? That, that's, I thought that was the whole point. The M2 and the B2, and when oh. I took the kernel, that is, that, that, that is creating the stuff that exactly you're asking. That those are symbols. You modify yeah. the boundary with those relations, the, the alpha beta plus beta and plus beta. Um, those are secret new boundaries of the two sequences. I think 
think there's several ways of, of, uh, of repackaging this. But, uh, so, so based on this, then the, uh, as a, if you take out as a container, then trivial. Correct. And you, I think you'll see that once we know things are genus zero, and right? The homology is true. There's not, nothing to integrate around. We'll, that's it. Okay. Um, well, let me tell you a little bit about these. Maybe, okay. I, 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 my sole, sole prerequisite is that someone has told you modular forms before. That's all that you need to know to understand this, this thing here. Okay? So first of all, it is a finite dimensional C vector space. Its dimension is an integer, um, and that integer, well, I'll call the integer g. Why would I call it g? Related to the genus. Okay. That I'm writing colon equals because in the right context, that is the definition of the genus. Okay. Um, there is a map. I, I don't know if you got so these are going to be things of the form locally f d z, where f is a function that I can then integrate. That's how you should intuitively think about any time you have a Riemann surface and you want a differential. Locally, they should look like if it locally means in some open neighborhood on your surface, it looks like the complex numbers. That's what it means to be a Riemann surface. Then you should have a local coordinate called z, and when you write Differentials, the definition is that they should locally look like f of z dz, where f is holomorphic in this case. Okay? And they have to satisfy a compatibility relation, which is says that if I change variables, um, I will get the same answer when I integrate, and that is a change of variables formula, a way of thinking about it, that you get a coherent set of things to integrate. Okay? Now, in this context where we have things of the upper half plane, which is nice and simply connected, there's a simple way to describe these. So there's a C vector space isomorphism of this with S2 gamma. There's no curly on the S. And these are maps. So if I'm just the, the map is called F goes to F of F of Z D Z. That's the map. Okay? And what does that mean? Well, in my local coordinate, I could just take the upper half plane, uh, and then I'm going to check that the function agrees if I take different representatives in the quotient mod gamma, so I'm thinking about my x of gamma as a quotient of our half plane, and then I want to check compatibility, that's going to be the condition for modularity. Okay, so these are holomorphic functions. And the condition that I want is that f of gamma z, d gamma z, is equal to f of z d z for all gamma and gamma. Okay, why a condition like that? That's supposed to say, well, it doesn't matter if I do the change of variables that replaces my little neighborhood around my point with the gamma or a gamma equivalent point, then I would have gotten the same thing as a differential. I see some pointing back there. Is it something? Question? Oh, I was just wondering, um, I was looking down, what is the error from like your f bar up to the f of z to z? Say, say that again? Or so, a little bit more to the Left. So right through your dimension of this thing. Yeah. This is a backslash maps to. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Thank you for asking. Okay, and 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 there's always annoying things happening at infinity. Okay? So the difference between a modular form and a cusp form is, what's the difference? Cusp forms have what property? They vanish at the cusp. They vanish at the cusp. Why do we need them to vanish at the cusp? Well, it's because when I integrate them, I will want them to give me a value. And OK, I'll show you what this looks like. So I need a plus. This is a reason to work with compact quotients. You don't have escape to infinity, but then this whole edifice collapses because all of the fun was in looking at gamma orbits of cusp and encoding all of the homology with an orbit of infinity. So you have to keep track of it somehow. So the dot, dot, dot is, well, I need uh, the limit as z goes to c for any cusp c, f of z is equal to 0 for all cusps. 
actually can see. Okay, sorry, the brackets may be needed to end. Okay? Now, why? What does this have to do with anything? Well, you guys must have done this calculation at some point. If you have not, maybe you should do it on a daily basis. Just to re refresh the motivation. Who cares about modular forms? Why? Well, you were just promised that they were intrinsic to number theory. You know the joke that uh, Eichler said there's five operations in mathematics, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modular forms. <laughs> okay, so that's really true, and that you maybe have to take our word for it. But the real reason I care about modular forms is because they're things I can integrate on, on, uh, uh, on modular curves, modular curves of arithmetic meaning. And so uh, if you don't like to think about this in a sort of classical complex analysis kind of way, you can think about this vector space, and this identification shows you why this condition here, this is the I'm well defined on the quotient, okay? And we can translate this into a condition on, well, when my gamma is A, B, C, D. The usual apologies here with the D and the D, this is like Roman D or something, and this is just dollar sign regular D. There's no way out there, okay? So, um, well, we want this to be equal to F of Z, D, Z. So uh, what's going to happen here? Well, there's, there, there's nothing I can do in this, this piece here that's just some other value. But this is D of something. If you use the Leibniz rule and linearity, I'm not going to do that here at the board, but you should, you will get uh, CZ plus D squared uh, F of Z. Well the, well, the factor that you get is not following my notes, and that's why I wrote down something that's not. This just takes it, it's like quotient. Okay, that's, that's all that happened there. And, okay, well, my AD minus BC is equal to 1. And then I need a DC. So if, in order for these two things to be equal, I need them to be equal on the level of functions, and that's the condition to be a modular form. Okay? So you can replace this condition with the usual relation, f of z, f of gamma z equals c z plus d squared, which is exactly the thing that appears here. Okay? So you're no longer scared about, well, okay, you're equally scared. <laughs> Depending, well, you get to take the the GCD of your level of scaredness because these two spaces are isomorphic. Okay, so if you understand anything, neither one of them you can transfer. Okay, what's the deal with the thing in infinity, with the cusp in infinity? Well, uh, uh, why do we have to require this vanishing condition in order to have a holomorphic differential on the quotient? Okay, well, if you're on the upper half plane, that doesn't tell me everything that's happening on X of gamma because there are points at infinity. Okay, I have to decide that it's still okay to, to have something holomorphic there. Okay? Now, uh, it's not enough to simply require that the function is holomorphic in infinity. I need the differential to be holomorphic in infinity. Okay? So let's choose a coordinate, just, just to practice, to show you why I actually needed to vanish there. So at the cusp infinity, um, well, I take the local coordinate q equals e to the 2 pi i z. Right? That's the right coordinate at infinity. Remember the neighborhoods that we wrote down at infinity? Those this, all things with imaginary part greater or equal to m, when I map them to the unit disk, they give me neighborhoods of infinity under this, this uh, known or, or coordinate. And what's the dq? Well, we really do need ice cream eventually. You, now you do this. You get e to the 2 pi or uh, z dz. All right, calculus is great. And then if I rewrite this thing, I hate writing that low. So then you get, well, what do you get? You get dz is 1 over 2 pi i, uh, dq over q. Okay, so in the, if you write it, remember I said about local coordinates and then I want the thing to be holomorphic? So if I take my q expansion, I write out f of z as a Q expansion, 
and then I look at the thing in the local coordinate at Q, well, I better have an extra Q there. Although, right, if it starts out with 1 plus dot, 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 then in the Q coordinate, the differential is going to be 1 over Q plus dot, 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 dq, and that has a pole. That's not holomorphic according to my definition. Okay? So these are sometimes called logarithmic differentials because when you integrate this thing, you get a log. But that's all that means. Okay, but this is why there is a condition. To be holomorphic, for the differential to be holomorphic in infinity, you need the function f to vanish there because of this coordinate change. That's all that is. Okay, that's, that's why it's possible. Okay. You guys still with me? Ready to integrate? So the integration pairing is called, I have a, a path around which I'm going to integrate, and a differential that I can integrate, so then I integrate. Okay? So I start with, I'm going to write this, but you could also write uh, S2 gamma if you want to think about it. Those are just uh, omega equals f of z dz, and I remember the f of z. Okay? Either way, so this is omega 1 x gamma, and I take my paths. This maps to C. I put a Z here because it's a little easier in my head to be thinking about an actual path, not a Q linear combination of paths. But the thing is supposed to be linear, so if I put a Q coefficient in front of one of my paths, then I'm going to. Um, take the Q multiple on the right hand side. So similarly I will extend scalars to R or C freely, but I, th for this purpose I want to think about it. Okay. So this is just if I took the combination of things. Okay, well I'll, I'll write the pairing with angle brackets. Okay, so then I take differential, I take a path between alpha beta, I'm writing it as symbols that way to really, get, like I said, you can write this as F C D C and you integrate. Now, because you see this 2 pi i over here, it's probably not so surprising that there's, it's, it's a good idea to cancel that factor out. So if you actually integrate one of these Q expansions, something with nice rational coefficients, then you, have, you cancel out the factor 2 pi i. That's where that's it. That's it there. That's just this. Okay. And if you wrote that out, so this is going to be 2 pi i. Alpha to beta, f of z. Okay, and I guess it's Cauchy's theorem that this is independent of the choice of representative of the classes. Um, you could also, I, 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 just like I said, you could also think about this as being S two gamma cross script S two gamma to c. As long